Welcome back to our next session on this Physical Geography Revision Masterclass. Today we're going to be looking at the glaciation topic in a bit more detail. So depending on which exam board you're doing, at some point you probably would have covered it as part of one of your optional topics. So glacia uh, glaci glacial landscapes is what we're covering today. Let's start off with the first section. So what are the key processes of glacial erosion? Make sure you have a pen and paper out and you're making notes as we're going along. And if you have any questions, you can pop them into the message board at any point. So what are the key processes of glacial erosion? Glacial erosion is a process by which Glaciers, which are huge masses of ice and snow, move across the Earth's surface and erode the land to, beneath them. There are three main ways that they do this, and those are plucking, abrasion, and freeze thaw. Plucking is when a glacier freezes onto the rock below it and then pulls pieces of that rock out as it moves along. This happens because of the weight of the glacier and the pressure of the ice cause the rock to fracture and break apart. The glacier then picks up those broken pieces and then carries them along with it. Abrasion is when the glacier grinds against the rock below it, wearing it down over time. This happens because the glaciers carry small particles of rock and sediment in the ice, which act like sandpaper as the glacier moves along. And this process can create deep grooves, scratches, polished surfaces on the rock itself. Freeze thaw, which you may have come across before, is when water seeps into the cracks in the rock and then freezes. When it freezes, when the water freezes, it expands and puts pressure on the rock, causing it to crack further. Over time, this is repeated again and again through the process of freezing and thawing, causing large pieces of rock to break off and be carried away by the glacier itself. Now all of these processes work together to shape the landscape in the area where the glaciers are present. As the glacier moves along, it can carve out deep valleys, creating large boulder fields and leave behind features called moraines. Moraines are basically piles of rock and sediment left behind a glacier. And you might also have a corrie or a cirque, same same thing, bowl shaped depressions on the sides of mountains. So the key thing to remember is that in your exam, you're probably going to be asked about one of these processes in a bit more detail. So a typical three mark question could be abrasion is an important process of glacial erosion. Describe how it works. And all you need to do here is substitute the word abrasion with plucking or freeze thaw and then attempt the same exam question again. Now, this is really um, going to be quite straightforward. You can just pick up and just um, write out a kind of rote answer uh, for that. Uh, yes, Tom, it could be Hanging Valleys. It's good to have you on the, on the chat. Now, um, remember those three, three processes in, in detail. Um, write them out by hand, uh, using a textbook if you're not familiar with them, and then test yourself or by closing the textbook and then rewriting out your answer without your notes in front of you. And once you've got it down, it should be pretty easy to remember. Now for this particular question, um, abrasion is the most is an important process of glacial erosion. Describe how abrasion works. We just need to talk about how abrasion uses the material to carry to carry um, how the vibration uses the material in the glass to carry the uh, material. And then you can also talk about how uh, this is taken from surrounding valley sides as a result of freeze thaw weathering or plucking, and how the material is then used to grind um, on the sides and the floor of the valley, uh, like a sandpapering effect, so it's worn away. Now, you don't have to mention all of those things, but a combination of some of those things would get you uh, three marks in total. You can apply that same um, thought um, for your um, other answers for plucking and for uh, freeze thaw as well. 
Okay, let's move on to the next section. So glacial landscapes, how do glaciers transport material? So glaciers transport material in a few different ways. And one of the ways is through a process called plucking, which we briefly looked at last time, where the glacier freezes onto rocks or sediment on the ground and then pulls it out as it moves along. And this can happen when ice in the glacier freezes onto the cracks in the rock as the glacier moves and it pulls pieces of rock away. Another, glacier, uh, another way that glaciers transport material is through a process called abrasion and as the glacier moves it grinds the rock below it wearing it down over time and this process can create a lot of small particles rock and sediment which then can be picked up by the ice and carried along by the glacier uh, as well. Another way or a third way is through um, the process of meltwater runoff so as glaciers are melting they need water that can carry their sediments and rocks away with it and the water can create streams and rivers that flow away from the glacier, carrying the material with it. A moraine, which we briefly looked at in the previous section, is a term that's used to describe the material that is deposited by a glacier as it moves along. So when a glacier melts, it leaves behind piles of rock, sediment and other debris. And these piles of material are called moraines. And there are four types of moraine that you need to be aware of. Side note, in your exam, they might give you a picture of a, a glacier um, and then they might ask you to identify what a moraine is on, on the photo, for example, or they might give you a diagram and get you to explain what a um, lateral moraine or a medial moraine might be. So let's go through the different types. So there are four um, main types of moraine. So the first one is lateral, lateral moraines, and these are piles of material that form along the sides of the glacier as it moves along. Then you have medial moraines. These are piles of material that form when two glaciers merge together. And the material that was originally along the sides of the glacier gets pushed together and forms a new medial moraine down the center of the merged glacier. Then you have terminal moraines, and these are piles of material that form at the end or the terminus of a glacier. So as it melts, it drops all that material that it was carrying in one big pile. You also have, uh, fourthly, uh, recessional moraines. And these are piles of material that form when a glacier retreats and moves back up the valley that it came from. As a glacier retreats, it leaves behind piles of material at different points along the way. The bulldozing is a term that's often used to describe the process by which a glacier can push or bulldoze material along as it moves. And this can happen when a glacier encounters a large boulder or another obstacle that is too big to pick up or move. So in these cases, the glacier will push the obstacle along with it creating a trail in the ground. So let's move on to looking at how glaciers move. And there are two main ways in which they move. The first is through basal slip and internal, de uh, internal deformation. So basal slip occurs when the ice at the base of the glacier melts and becomes liquid water, allowing the glacier to slide over the ground below. And this happens because the pressure of the ice on the rock on the ground causes the ice to melt. And then the liquid water acts as a lubricant that allows the glacier to move over it very easily. And this is the main way that the glaciers move in areas where the ice is thick enough to reach the ground. Internal deformation, on the other hand, occurs when the in the glacier is under pressure and begins to deform or flow like a viscous flow. This happens in areas where the ice is thinner or where the glacier is up a slope. And as the ice flows, it can bend and stretch, causing the glacier to move. Rotational slip is the type of movement that occurs in areas where the glacier is moving around a bend 
four curve in the landscape. And as the glacier moves, the ice outside of the curve moves faster than the ice on the inside, causing that glacier to twist and rotate. So you can see that example in the diagram uh, that's on the screen here. So the movement of glaciers can vary depending on its season. So in the summer, when temperatures are warmer, more meltwater is produced, and this can cause an increase in base or slip. And this means that glaciers can move a lot more quickly in the summer than in the winter. Now in the winter, when the temperatures are colder, there's less meltwater, and then the ice can become a little bit more brittle and prone to cracking. And this can cause the glacier to move more slowly and be more prone to internal deformation. So a typical exam question could be, describe how ice transports materials. And generally this would be a three mark question. So I'd suggest that you write that question down and attempt answering it. If you're not, not sure how to answer it, then you can use your textbook or you can replay this video when we're done. But just to go through it with you, uh, what kind of things you might want to be looking at when you're answering this question, you need to make sure that you're talking about how ice carries material on top of it, um, also within it and beneath it on the sides of the glacier as well. Um, and this material is known as moraine. So if this falls onto the surface due to freestyle weathering, then from the sides and most of the ice, it can get into a lot into the ice by a large number of cracks or crevasses that are formed on the glacier itself. You can also have plucking and abrasion that leads to further material uh, beneath the glacier as it's eroding uh, at the base of the glacier. And you can also talk about how material is being pushed to the front of the glacier where it's moved along through the process of bulldozing. So any of those three things, a combination of those, you know, well explained would get you uh, three marks. You don't need to mention all of those things that I talked about uh, to get uh, three marks in, in total. Okay, so let's move on to the next section, which is how do they deposit material? So glaciers deposit material in a few different ways. And the first one is that when a glacier melts, it leaves behind piles of material in the form of moraines. Moraines are essentially large piles of rocks, sediment and debris that the glacier has carried along with it. So as mentioned before, we talked about uh, the different types of moraine, lateral moraines, medial moraines, moraines, and recessional moraines. Make sure that you know those four different types. Um, they're pretty simple to remember, pretty straightforward. If you're not sure, then write them out and then um, uh, revise them by rote. So secondly, uh, when a glacier melts, it also deposits material in the form of erratics. So you can see this picture that's on the screen. Typically in your exam, they might give you a picture to look at and then explain what it is or how it got there. So this is a glacial erratic. And these large boulders of rocks have been carried by the glacier and then deposited in a new location where the glacier melts. And then sometimes these boulders can be found in areas where there's no other rock of that particular type nearby. And that gives you evidence that at one point that was carried by a glacier. Thirdly, glaciers can also deposit material in the form of outwash plains. So when a glacier melts, it releases a lot of water, which can carry sediment and debris away from the glacier and deposit it in a new location. These deposits are known as outwash plains, and they can be found downstream of a glacier itself. And finally, glaciers can also deposit material in the form of glacial lakes. So when a glacier melts, it creates depressions in the ground where the ice used to be. And these depressions can fill in with water, creating new lakes. And 
as uh, the water in the lake flows in and out, it can carry sediment and debris with it depositing uh, on the lake uh, bottom. So overall, glaciers can deposit material in lots of different ways, leaving behind a range of different features and landforms. And it really helps geographers, geologists, uh, glaciologists to understand what the processes are involved in how landscapes have changed over time. So a typical um, question on your exam might be an eight mark question where they ask you to explain what the diff different landforms are from the different glacial processes. And of course, um, there's quite a few of these that you could refer to and which I haven't talked about in a lot of detail, but you would need to go away and revise in a bit more detail. So here are some examples of ones that you could talk about for this particular question. Distinctive landforms result from different glacial processes illustrate the statement with reference to one landform of erosion and one landform of deposition. So for example, you might talk about a corrie and how that forms. You might talk about how a ret, a ret, a r e t e forms. Pyramidal peaks, how they might form a glacial trough, a truncated spur, a ribbon lake, or a hanging valley, uh, are all features of erosion. And then the depositional features that you could possibly talk about could be drumlins, lateral, medial, ground, and terminal moraine. So those are all examples of depositional features. Now, my suggestion would be that you learn at least two uh, minimum from the, the erosional features and the depositional features uh, so that you've got something to work with uh, should you be asked this in the exam in a bit more detail. So for example, you might want to learn about um, corries. So corries are circular, um, they're arm-shaped hollows that occur near the starts of the glacier and they provide the ice of the glacier while the moraine, and especially the terminal moraine, is deposited at the end. There's a clear difference where these landforms occur. And glacial erosion processes like plucking and abrasion lead to steep circular ho hollows as the snow is compressed into ice and has great erosive power to create steep, deep circular ho hollows in the mountain carved out of solid rock. And this also involves the removal of material, whereas moraine is a leaving of material behind, possibly on the long the glacier itself. And this has different shapes to the circular quarry and is made of loose bits of rock of all shapes and sizes rather than the solid rock itself. Okay, so let's move on to the next section. So now we're going to look at what are the economic opportunities found in glacial environments. So glacial environments can provide a range of economic opportunities for people who live near them. And I'm going to go through a couple of examples um, of which I would probably say you need to learn at least two uh, in detail so that you're confident in writing a long answer question in the exam. So tourism is the obvious one. So glaciers and the surrounding landscapes can be a major tourist attraction. And people come from all over the world to see glaciers, go hiking or skiing in glacial areas, or take part in other outdoor activities like fishing, camping, or wildlife watching. This in itself can create jobs in tourism, industry so you might have jobs created for tour guides or hotel staff or restaurant workers typically you'll find that these sorts of jobs are seasonal jobs and they will bring a significant amount of income during peak months in the summer but uh, during the weaker months uh, you, you might have um, less well, 
in the glacial environments, it would be the opposite. So in winter months, you probably have a lot more people who are visiting these areas, depending on what activity they're doing. Now, uh, glacial environments can also be, secondly, a place where you might have uh, energy production. So for example, there might be a um, source of renewable energy if there's geothermal um, events available, which can be exploited. But also, generally, these areas tend to have lots of water, so you can build hydro-power facilities um, near the glaciers and use the melt water from the glaciers to generate electricity. And these can help provide energy for homes, businesses, and industries in the area too. Thirdly, agriculture is also uh, common in these areas. Um, Meltwater from glaciers can provide a reliable source of irrigation water for good farmers to grow crops in areas that otherwise might be too dry. And again, this creates jobs not only in farming, but also in food production. Fourthly, you might have mining in these areas. So some minerals and, others and other resources can be found in these areas, such as gold, silver, copper, zinc. And mining these resources can help providing good so overall, there are many economic opportunities in glacial environments. And while these environments can be quite harsh and challenging, they can provide important sources of opportunities for communities as well as the people that live them. in them. So let's look at this exam question. Economic activity can cause conflict between different land uses in glaciated upland areas. Do you agree with this statement? Explain your answer. So in your exam, you're probably going to have to make a decision, yes or no. You can't sit on fence with these sorts of questions. So a top band answer will obviously be really well developed and it will have plenty of supporting evidence to go with it. And you'll find that there will be a balanced uh, and a definite decision. So if you want to get five to six marks, you're going to have to say yes or no, and then give evidence supporting that position. Of course, for this particular question, there are lots of different things that you could talk about, uh, you know, and my suggestion would be to learn at least one case study. For example, the Lake District might be a good example. To, to use when arguing for or against uh, your viewpoints. So typical things that you could talk about would be things like congestion, pollution from cars, or that recreational activity damages the fragile environment because you might have soil erosion interfering with the flora and the fauna. You might want to talk about how tourists leave uh, gates open while walking and exploring an area, and this can lead to uh, animals basically escaping and potentially being lost or in the process, and this would affect the income of the farmer. Um, you might also have uh, to talk about how people have bought second homes in these areas, and this reduces the chances of people who live in these places to be able to afford to live there. It also may lead to a reduction in local services. Um, Energy regulation is a big thing in the UK, um, and as a consequence of that, in rural areas, you're going to find lots of schools, as a consequence, can't operate and may shut down, forcing young families to move away. Uh, you might also have conflicts with swimming. So people might go swimming in the lake, and people who live there don't like that idea. Or it might be an issue because you might have sailing boats on there. Um, other issues might be to do with building dams, and that could affect how valleys are flooding during the course of its cycle. Um, and obviously, electricity pylons do create an eyesore in these areas and may even put tourists off from visiting it. You also might have quarrying that leads to pollution of lands and rivers. So make sure that you refer to lots of different examples uh, in these any sort of those sorts of answers. Um, 
a good example, I think, from the Lake District might be the is it wire proposal um, in Kirkland Moor. And that was dropped after opposition. And there's been a lot of opposition to building wind farms in the same area. Um, and then as a consequence, uh, those, those didn't go ahead because people were against them. So you've got to make sure that you evaluate the end of the, the question after you've answered it um, and talk about the fact that you're going to have some significant conflicts of interest between tourism and the people who use the land um, in the area. And you might want to talk about the fact that some activities are more or less intrusive than others. And it's difficult to overlook the um, advantages employment uh, and revenue but um, you know in, in depending on how you're arguing it you might argue that uh, there are plenty of uh, disadvantages of um, of exploiting the opportunities that are available in the area so my suggestion would be to, to go away and you know write down three things um, depending on which side of the argument that you're going to argue um, three examples of conflict and then give three pieces of evidence for those and that should be that should help you with a well-rounded answer to that question Okay, so let's move on to the next part. So what are the conflicts in glacial environments? We'll talk about these in a, a bit more detail again. This will help you to, to write that previous answer that we were looking at. So while glacial environments can provide lots of economic opportunities, there can be some conflicts and challenges. We're going to go through four of these. So the first one is water resources. One of the biggest conflicts in glacial environments is over water resources. So as glaciers melt, they release a lot of fresh water, which then can be used for irrigation, drinking water and other purposes. However, different groups may have competing interests on in how that water is used, and that can lead to conflicts between farmers, industries and communities. Tourism and development is the second point. So as more people visit glacial environments for tourism, there can be conflicts between those who want to preserve the natural beauty of an area and those who want to build new developments, such as hotels or ski resorts. This can lead to debates about how best to balance the economic development with environmental conservation. Third point, mining and resource extraction. As mentioned earlier, glacial environments can be a source of valuable resources such as minerals and oil. However, mining and resource extraction can have serious negative environmental impacts, such as water pollution, habitat destruction, and soil erosion. And these conflicts, these can create conflicts between those who want to exploit the resources and those who want to protect it. And fourth, climate change. Perhaps the biggest conflict in glacial environments is over climate change. So as the Earth's climate is warming, glaciers are melting, at much faster rate, causing sea levels to rise and changing weather patterns around the world. This can have serious impacts on people and the wildlife that live in glacial environments. They can also have global consequences. So for example, it might lead to increased flooding and even more severe weather events occurring. So you might have, for example, even more intense monsoon seasons or more intense hurricane seasons tropical cyclones, and so forth. So overall, while glacial environments can provide lots of economic opportunities, they can also be the site of conflicts and challenges, particularly as climate change continues to alter the landscape. So let's have a look at this exam question uh, to wrap this up. So tourist activities can cause conflicts. Describe ways in which conflicts have been managed in a tourist honeypot that you've studied. 
So going back to the previous question that we looked at, the example of a tourist high spot might be the Lake District. And for this question, you'd have to think about um, how you can manage those conflicts. So for example, um, to get a top band march list, you know, level four to five, you need to make sure that you're clearly describing the management strategy. So an example of this might be something like signposts can be used to make sure tourists keep farmers' fields, uh, keep off farmers' fields, so they reduce uh, the, the trampling of the crops. Or you might write that um, you, you leave a signpost to advise you know, tourists to close the gate behind them so that animals don't wander off. So those are going to be uh, the sorts of things that you need to, to refer to. And of course, uh, if you're referring to specific examples from a specific location, uh, that will help you to get um, a level two, uh, four to five marks. Now, I also want to uh, put a caveat here because this is what often happens with these sorts of questions. And it's, it's very easy to, to write things which are quite um, you know, simple, such as, um, you might say, uh, don't um, um, don't build car parks, or you might say, uh, put in more knitted bins everywhere. Um, so if you're going to write just basic statements for your answer, then you're going to be limited to getting one to three marks. So just be aware of that. Um, and these sorts of things are really quite quite simple to remember. Again, it's just. A, case of just going back through your case study note, pulling out um, a couple of examples of how things could be managed or improved and just trying to remember them, right? So remember for these four or five mark questions, just remember that you've got to make sure that you are describing why that particular management strategy is appropriate and how does it help to reduce um, those conflicts um, specifically. Okay, so we've covered quite um, quite a bit. We've covered the entire topic um, for glacial landscapes in this um, session today. If you have any questions, uh, just pop them into the chat. Um, something that perhaps I haven't covered or uh, maybe you're not sure about uh, to let me know. Uh, as I'm waiting for you to, to do that, I'm just going to go through just to remind you again that particularly when it comes to exam questions, that you know there is a strategy. You're just going to practice writing your answers. If you're finding that over the Easter break, regardless of whether you're in year 10 or year 11, if you are just making cue cards and just testing yourself on that, that's that's great. But if you haven't done an exam question, you're going to be caught out because you're going to write it out in the exam. So there are plenty of exam questions on here, on, on, on the slides that I've come through today. Make sure that you go back through those questions specifically and ask the, uh, answer those questions. Now, if you struggle with them, of course, use your textbook, of course, use your notes, but at least attempt to do those questions because it will give you the confidence in the exam to be able to overcome it rather than what often happens is students either write very um, basic answers or bullet points or in some cases may even leave their answers completely blank. And it's not because they don't know the stuff, it's just because they, they, they haven't um, practiced doing exam questions regularly. Whenever you get an exam question, make sure that you annotate the question before you answer it. So you just get those thoughts out of your mind and it helps your brain then to focus on writing a better answer because you, you your mind knows okay i've got this bit of information right here right for this question i need to talk about corries or arets right i've got that there i've got to make sure that i answer that uh, and refer to it and it gives you that bit of boost and confidence in the exam as well okay um make sure that you're writing the third person uh, for example the most critical factor appears to be make sure that you're writing as if the person reading your answer gets a sense that you are speaking with authority. What essentially that means is that when they're 
reading your answer, it could be anybody, and they will know that okay, this is it. This is uh, this is really well explained, and now I can go and explain this to somebody else. Remember, your exam is a demonstration of your knowledge and your understanding, and that's what you're going to get marks for. It's not based on your teacher marking it, because in the actual exam, the external exam, the people marking it are not going to know who you are, right? So they can't give you benefit of the doubt. You have to know this stuff. And you've got to make sure that you're writing clearly and neatly if you're writing by hand. Uh, it's very, very important. And remember, you're going to be writing the exam for over an hour and a bit, okay? Um, and it's if you've not practiced writing for that long, you know, um, you might struggle a bit. So just start get into the habit, get that uh, motion uh, going over the Easter break, and hopefully when it comes to your actual uh, end of years or your um, external exam later this summer, um, you are well prepared for it. So for these, a um, uh, good question uh, regarding the practice papers. Um, so go, if you don't have the mark scheme available to you, then just go back into your textbook and pick out those areas and read the, the content. That's probably the best way to get a gauge of what the expectation will be. It's really not that um, you know, uh, challenging to, to figure out which part of the content um, the exam question is referring to. And if you're um, going to be doing these exam questions that I've gone over today and yesterday, then I've actually talked about uh, what you should be including in your answer anyway. Um, so hopefully that will help for you uh, with that as well. Okay, so if you have any more questions, uh, pop them into the chat now. Um, tomorrow we're going to be going over weather hazards. So that, that will be quite detailed. We'll go through a couple of case studies as well um, in detail. And we'll look at um, how we can um, manage them. Uh, the, the issues surrounding uh, weather hazards and Thursday we'll move on to a, another topic. I hope you're finding this really helpful. Um, please do um, share this with your um, your friends um, so that they can benefit too um, from, from this and of course I recommend that you go back and review anything, go back and listen to any particular part uh, which you, you need a little bit more revision on. There are a lot more resources on the YouTube channel when it comes to exam practice. So if I can direct you towards, there's a whole section that I've done on glacial landscapes. There's five particular lessons, which I go into a lot more detail for the specific sections. And there are specific um, exam questions, videos that I've done on glacial landscapes before. I've shown examples of perfect answers and you know, not so good answers and how you should go about writing them. So my advice would be to just go back and look at some of those videos and see how you can, um, can learn from those um, for the Glacius topic in particular, but there's all, all sorts of other ones as well. Okay, so I, if there aren't any more questions, I'll give you guys another 30 seconds. And, um, I will see you tomorrow, same time at 10.15 a.m. for weather hazards.